Welcome, everybody. For those of you who may not frequent this building very often, I'm uh, Dr. Stephen Scheinman, and this is the first occasion on which the Commonwealth Medical College has co-sponsored a Schemmel Forum uh, with the University of Scranton, and I will tell you on behalf of the college, we are very honored uh, that this is the case. And uh, Sandra Myers and I agree that this will not be the last time that this happens. But I think it is uh, wonderful uh, that we have our two very distinguished, exciting, engaged, and uh, lively guests uh, for tonight, whom I will allow Sandra to introduce. Sandra Myers. So uh, welcome all to Live from TCMC. Our consummate conversationalist, Paul Holdengraber, curator of the highly touted Live from NYPL, that is New York Public Library, is back in town as the guest of the Schemmel Forum, and in, the, in this case, the, Med, the Commonwealth Medical College, as well as Paul has come here once again to engage in conversation with a star from another galaxy, Raul Campo, <laughs> Dr. Raul Campo, right? A medical doctor and poet who brings new meaning and new effectiveness to the relationship between science and art. Before I go further, I want to thank uh, Dean Stephen Scheinman for joining the Schimmel Forum in this project. Uh, I often refer to the medical college as the best thing that has happened in our region in my lifetime, and I mean it. I'm deeply honored that TCMC joins with us in this endeavor and look forward to our next events. Paul Holdenrober has taken New York by storm with his conversation and, and, and luster. He adds uh, luster to the revered institution of, of the New York Public Library and to the city. He has, in a sense, uh, redefined the art of conversation. A reporter for the Huffington Post observed that he possesses a complement of skills, charm, erudition, curiosity, and perhaps most of all, chutzpah, <laughs> that make his conversations all that much better. The other essential factor, of course, is the distinction of the person with whom Paul is conversing. Raul Campo is that person tonight. He is a man of, mag of, of the magnitude of breadth, breadth, breadth and depth, the talent and compassion that assures us all an extraordinary evening. Dr. Campo is a true virtuoso, an artful healer, who has gracefully agreed to submit himself to the inimitable elective surgery of Paul <laughs> Please, let's, let's now eavesdrop on their conversation. I, I truly thank you, Sondra, for inviting me back for the third time uh, to the Scranton. It's always a, a pleasure, and, and to you, Dean Scheinman, for, for co-presenting this. I think that the poetry reading we heard earlier, I've really heard such attention in the students, and I think that's quite extraordinary for you to have taken that risk. And that risk actually is wonderful because it exposes students to maybe something that might change their life. One just never knows. Um, it's really a great pleasure to talk to you, and you were talking about surgery. I hope it isn't painful, <laughs> but I hope there is some, some scrutiny that might go into what I will ask you. Uh, as long as I leave with all of my body parts intact, I think I'll Let's feel... Let's see. Let's okay. see. Um, <laughs> You know, in, in, hearing your, your conver in hearing your reading before, um, I'd like to start differently than I was going to. In, in a sense, you made me think that your patients are in some way writing the poems. Mm. I think that's true in, in so many ways, actually. It's a really interesting observation. I find that uh, as I make my way through the hospital and through the clinic, I'm immersed in the voices of my patients. And, and certainly, I think when I engage with them in the work of healing and really I try to be present with them as they experience suffering, I'm really immersing myself fully in, in their voices. And so, so to my mind, that's a wonderful kind of compliment if indeed my patients, in some sense, are writing through me. Uh, I think that's a wonderful way of, of imagining uh, my, my project in, in poetry, which is really, I think, in some ways to think about how 
language, how the poem can be an empathetic medium. And in fact, uh, I'm fond of saying that, that, that poems really enact empathy. I think of all of the literary formats and, and uh, various ways of expressing ourselves creatively uh, through art, I think the poem comes closest to that empathetic uh, moment where we are immersed in another's experience, another's voice, uh, sometimes even physically so. Um, uh, you, you said earlier on that, that empathy is something so hard to define. Yes, yes. Um, what, I mean, one of my greatest pleasures in life is speaking to people whose discipline I really don't know. Mm. Um, it makes me in need of immersing myself in their world. And I always say that I approach my, my subjects with a euphoria of ignorance. Mm. And so in, in, in some way, I, you know, in speaking with you, I'm speaking to someone whose discipline I don't know, but I'm sometimes subjected to it when I'm indeed a patient. Mm. Um, empathy seems to me to, to, to be a way of identifying with something that is extraneous to you, but nevertheless very close to the core of your being. Mm. And in some way it's an ability to walk in shoes that may not quite fit. Yes, yes. And I'm wondering, you know, if, I know it's difficult to define, but yeah. how might you go about it? Well, that's a wonderful question. I think in, in, I guess I might say to begin with that medicine provides a wonderful kind of context for examining that definition and that question uh, because I think we're so practiced in our work at distancing, at doing the opposite, at removing ourselves from the experience of another person. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, like Auden's wonderful poem, uh, averting one's gaze from Bruegel's painting, that we, we, we almost can't bear to see the suffering of another person. And so in medicine, we, we then take ourselves away. We subtract ourselves from, from those experiences. And part of that is, is self-protective, I think, self-preservation, perhaps. And I think part of that is also a sense that, um, or perhaps a deep recognition that, on some level, maybe we can't know another person's experience of suffering, that there is a, a kind of a tension there that, that uh, makes it really impossible to do, to do that. Uh, on the other hand, I think that my own experiences in medicine have, have taught me that, indeed, at the very least, we must make that attempt. We must make that gesture to wade into the awfulness of what another person is going through, even if it scares us, even if it, uh, it in some sense, pushes us away. Uh, because it's only through that empathetic gesture, I think, that we can really uh, achieve healing, that, that beyond the, the biomedical cure, which of course is very, very important, uh, we of course must prescribe the correct antibiotic and correct the potassium level and, and do those medical interventions correctly. But, but we may miss the opportunity to really heal uh, if that's all we do, if we don't allow ourselves to be present, to hear those last words when there isn't going to be another round of chemotherapy, to, to just sit with someone and, and witness the pain that they experience when there isn't a stronger narcotic that we can prescribe. So those moments, I think, really challenge us, and I think empathy is necessary to be really a, a true healer uh, and to get, again, beyond that simple sort of biomedical uh, solution that we all, on some level, seek and we all wish for. Uh, it would be wonderful if we could cure mortality. Uh, but would we haven't be, gotten there yet. Though, maybe not. <laughs> well, you know, I think it's a, it's a wonderful uh, retort. I think, you know, I myself uh, uh, worry about living in a world of cyborgs where we, where we have uh, figured out some kind of solution uh, to our own mortality. I much prefer uh, the world of mystery where one uh, is present at another person's experience and, and feels be bewilderment feels uh, insufficient, feels uh, humbled uh, by things that perhaps we can never entirely explicate. And, uh, you know, everything you, you're saying now points to me in the direction of 
uh, making ourselves available to to pain mm. and making ourselves avail available to vulnerability. Yes. And I know there's a, um, a I don't know if it's a, a, a part of a poem or just a line from Rumi, where mm. which you quote: "The wound is a place where the light enters you," which reminded me very much of uh, the Leonard Cohen Cohen Ansem. There is a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Mm. And I'd like you to comment on that. Yes, bit. yes, it's a wonderful. Uh, uh, I think to 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 recognize that indeed that that it is in our imperfections, it is in our shortcomings, perhaps it's it is in our wounds that we uh, I think have a kind of window into our our true selves. And and I think certainly my own, if I reflect back on my own experience and uh, of difference in some sense, you know, coming here uh, as an immigrant to this country, uh, growing up gay. Uh, feeling uh, or being made to feel perhaps by by the larger culture uh, some of these fractures some of these disconnects if you will uh, some of these differences uh, and, and and beginning to wonder whether indeed the poem is a way perhaps to uh, heal those fractures to 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 see inside those wounds and and make oneself whole and and to recognize perhaps ultimately that we're not actually all so different that we experience pain I think despite what we might consider these you know uh, irreconcilable identity uh, uh, disparities or differences uh, that we might yet still experience pain in the same way that the language of our pain the language of our ecstasy the language of our physical bodies when I listen to the heartbeat through the stethoscope I can't tell what nationality that patient might be. I, I, I'm hearing something much more uh, profound, much much deeper, uh, that, that joins us. Uh, that is something that I heard, uh, I imagine, in the wound, womb, rather, and, 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 and in the wound. It's interesting. And in the wound. I did catch that. Yes. <laughs> and in the wound. That slippage so. is fascinating. That is actually an interesting, uh, yes, <laughs> slip, as, slip. As, as it were. Maybe a poem in it. And maybe there is a poem. In it. Yes, thank you, thank you. I'm going to well, take no, but advantage Thank of you, it. thank you. I think you're thanking me in in a way very similar to what I said at the beginning about patients writing your poems. Yes, absolutely. In, in some way, you there's an immediacy of experience for you that translates in, in the possibility of expression. Yes, by all means. I think you know it is those moments when I am you know in physical proximity to my patient where I, I'm often most drawn to that imaginative uh, experience of writing. When I want to be writing, I feel uh, that, you know, that, that heartbeat again through, this, the, through the stethoscope is such a powerful prompt to, uh, I want to capture something about this interaction. I want to make this interaction heard in a, in a different context perhaps, but, but that, that acknowledges and, and more than that, that really affirms you know, the shared humanity of that moment. Uh, th that heartbeat is, in a, in a sense, rhythmically connected to the rhythm of poetry. Yes, absolutely. And I, I've sometimes heard, you know, uh, oh, a kind of a teleologic uh, explanation of, of metrical poetry, iambic pentameter, that, you know, that yes, we hear these rhythms uh, probably before we're even conscious of them, uh, and, and, and that's why they permeate uh, poetry uh, it's an attempt, perhaps, to to uh, recapture those physical, innate rhythms in our body, those very visceral rhythms, and uh, and I do have to say, after experiencing uh, close listening of both poetry and and the body, that the two are very much linked. I think I'm very happy to hear you talk so soon about listening because I'd like to talk to you about listening. It's uh, perhaps professionally what I do. Mm. Um, when I was 11 years old, my, my mother said to me, you know, Paulie, we have two ears and one mouth. <laughs> and I'm sure she said that to me because I wasn't listening. Um, and I always, when I'm asked what the origin or source of my uh, ability in so far that it is one is, it, it is precisely listening. Yes. And you, for you, the power of listening is, is perhaps primordial. 
Oh, absolutely. You, you should be a physician, Paul. Well, you know, we need more listeners like you in, in the medical profession. Well, maybe, maybe you can coach me. <laughs> um, I, I think that's absolutely true, that, that listening is such an important aspect of certainly healing. But and also rather than talking. Yes. Um, and, you know, it's so easy to interrupt, as I just did. <laughs> but, you know, yes, I think listening. And, 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 you know, that's another thing perhaps that, you know, connects poetry to medicine. I think that the most uh, important moments in the relationship with a patient are often those moments in which I have silenced myself and have, have listened empathetically, I hope, listened uh, fully to what someone else is saying and not, not interrupted. And, and, you know, we doctors are famous for uh, interrupting patients within the first couple of minutes. They've actually done studies of this that show that many doctors uh, interrupt patients before they even have a chance to get their first few sentences out. That we're so Why? intent on imposing our own narrative, I think, our own anxiety about uh, what might be wrong with the patient, uh, that we, we neglect the most important source of the information that will, will tell us, that will open that wound to our, to our eyes and to our, to our hearts, I think. Uh, that will tell us actually what's what's wrong. What you know, what comes to my mind is that they're cutting. Yes, and we are extraordinarily good at at, at cutting at, and and in fact, uh, uh, you may know that that physicians are are frequently reimbursed more for cutting for intervening than they are for simply listening for simply being present, uh, and more and more the pressures on doctors. Uh, that relate to how we are paid for what we do, uh, I think reflect that, you know, reflect that sense of we must be always intervening, we must always be doing something. Uh, and, and to listen is, is, is really not important. And, and in fact, uh, I think the exact opposite is true, that we must be attentive listeners, we must be present with our patients in order to be effective healers. You know, recently I had some surgery um, and it struck me, I mean, many things struck me, of course, but one of, first of all, what struck me is that I made my body available to somebody I barely knew, <laughs> um, and barely knew, and who barely took any time to, to get to know me. Mm. Um, as a matter of fact, this doctor spent a fair amount of time looking at the screen mm. instead of looking at me. Yes. I mean, I felt as though there was a sensory deprivation mm. in being in that office. Yes. And I wonder if you can address the, the why of that, because there seems to mm. be um, a, a reason for, I mean, you know, we're all with these engines and machines in our hands, but it would seem that a privileged moment would be a doctor's visit in that mm, way. Yes. Well, it really ought to be, I, I think, Paul. And uh, I think, unfortunately, some of what you experienced uh, likely stems from, from the training that physician received in medical school, where not long ago, uh, and really it continues very much to this present day, distancing was actively taught as an important capacity for physicians to master in order to be effective doctors. One had to learn how to distance oneself because clouding the picture with an emotional response to what a patient is, is reporting uh, was thought or felt to be counterproductive. And, and so there's, I think, an explicit part of the training that does that to doctors. And I think also, you know, there are a number of pressures on docs these days that have to do with the tremendous burgeoning of technology, and we have now all kinds of screens interposed between us and our patients, whether it's the tablet that we're using to look up, you know, the side effects of the medication, or whether it's the screen that we're looking at the CT scan on, or whether it's, you know, that we have all of these technologies that uh, get between us and our patients, and so I think that's another factor. And I think also the, the fact that, you know, medicine has, has evolved in, in a way uh, that doesn't entirely reflect the diversity of the people we care for. And so, so that kind of disconnect across culture, across experience, can also be a real barrier, I think, for doctors uh, to be fully present with their patients. I don't speak Somali. How can I, how can I even 
talk to this patient, never mind take care of them. So it's much easier then to use the language of technology. I'll just look at the x-ray of the knee and I, that way I don't even have to talk to the patient at all. I don't have to worry about an interpreter. I don't have to worry about getting involved in whatever trauma occurred in, in, in the patient's home country that, you know, I, why get involved in that? Let me focus on the biomedical. It's a way of narrowing, I think, uh, the field of investigation down to a point that feels uh, more manageable, that feels like, oh, I have uh, a factual uh, data-driven response to this. I don't have to get into my own vulnerabilities. I don't have to. Yes, because, because getting involved is also how can one get involved 20 times a day? Yes, and, and, and so that gets to this sort of notion of distancing, I think, and why doctors were taught that. Uh, I think, you know, there was this sense that docs, if we did open ourselves, our hearts to our patients, that that and we our might, fingers uh, to yes, our patients. Uh, yes, that we... So there was a, ta there's a kind of a tactile deprivation. Exactly. That that might, you know, really imperil good diagnosis, that we... We, we couldn't feel anything because... We shouldn't be touched. You, we, exactly. And even touching a patient now, I, I'm astonished at how little physical diagnosis now is taught. Abraham Vergase had a wonderful piece not too long ago in, uh, I think it was in the New York Times, talking about this, that we don't teach our students anymore how to do a physical exam, how to touch a patient in a way that is at once meaningful and caring, that, that conveys caring, and at the same time tells us about what's happening inside that patient's body. And it's a tremendous loss if we can only see our patients through the lens of these technologies. If we are only seeing them through the CT scanner and the ultrasound and whatever other machine we invent, uh, we are not going to see the person in front of us. And that person then becomes another fibroid uterus. If that patient becomes another fractured patella. It, 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 the patient loses her or his own specific story in that transaction. And that's, that's terribly troubling to me because, again, I think the narrative, the empathetic connection is what is most healing about those, those interactions we have with our patients. It's amazing how much language is so metaphoric already. Mm. So yes. the word touching, being touched by. Yes. Um, it already contains, I mean, the, the, the yes. lack of it. Yes already points to something that, that we're missing. I mean, yes. I know, you know, I brought up my mother, so I'll, I might as well bring up my father, who had two years of medical s uh, school ah. in the late 1930s in Vienna. He kept keep saying that it's the best medical school in the world except for Montpellier. Why Montpellier? I'm not mm. sure. But um, <laughs> one of the most important things was some form of tactile inebriation yeah. that mm. you learned, and you learned also to look. Yes to read facial, yes. I mean, to, I'm looking at you now. Yes. And I need to look at you to understand what you might say, much like we begin our life yes. by being with parents or caregivers whose faces we learn to interpret. Absolutely. And so what has happened that oh. we got so twisted and torn away from what seems so immediate and primordial? Yes. I, Easy I, question. I wish I could answer that uh, as eloquently as you posed the question, Paul, because I think it, it Take is... Take your time. It's really, it's, really a, it's really profoundly, I think, troubling. And I think, you know, I don't want to sound like a Luddite and I don't want to sound like I'm a technophobe, but, but I do think the invasion of technology in our lives is partly to blame, I think, for that. We are so much more practiced now, it seems to me, at looking at screens, looking at images, looking at whether it's the television, whether it's the tablet, whether it's the iPhone, whatever that technology is that uh, presents those images to us on demand in a way that we, that gives us the delusion and some sense of control over those images. And so, so when we look at patients, it's very hard, I think, because we suddenly don't control how the patient appears to us. We don't, the only control we have really as we were, saying before is perhaps to avert our gaze, is to look away and to look at that screen again and to train our, our minds and our eyes on, on that uh, because that we can manipulate, that we can uh, uh, turn off, if you will. Um, you can't turn off another person's gaze. You can't turn off another person's 
uh, suffering, really, I think. And, and, and that's a scary thought for us in our moment. Um, uh, and, that, and that, perhaps, again, is uh, the beginning of an argument for why, why the humanities and medical education might be important, why we must not lose sight, literally, of our patients. And, and, and one way, I think, to do that is through the experience of, of reading, of, of gazing at a work of art, at a photograph, and looking at it, not to click through to the next image, but, but to really immerse. immerse. Yes. I mean, you, you, so the virtue I see you um, elevating is a virtue of, um, of slowness. Yes. I would um, be an advocate for slow medicine, I think. <laughs> we talk so much about uh, slow food and slow... I think slow medicine is what, what we ought to uh, perhaps at least teach more in medical training. So and so poetry in that way yes. helps. Poetry is in slow way, medicine, yes. Yeah, but poetry is slow medicine in so far that it teaches you slow reading. Yes, it teaches, it teaches, I think, not only empathetic listening, to stop talking for one minute and listen to what the poem is saying, listen, and not to be fearful also of, of what might be mysterious in the poem. I think that's another wonderful thing about the humanities, again, in the context of medicine, is that sense that we may not be able to explicate everything. And you know what? That's okay. It's okay not to know the 19th item on the differential. We train our students that if, if they don't know that, they are going to kill someone. And in fact, that's not true. What Explain to me what that means, actually. <laughs> I mean, not uh, the 19th. What, what, what does that all mean? Uh, well, you know, we, uh, perhaps another way of, of describing it is that we're so intent on the facts. No, on the, the reason data. I asked you yes. all, all that is also because, in a sense, you're doing now something that is so interesting that you criticize, which is speaking a language that I'm unable to understand. Yes, and we the do 19th that. Differential, Thank you for I have no idea what you're talking about. Thank you for, I know for catching I should. me on that. No, yes. no, no, I'm no, catching you. You oughtn't, actually, because it is a medical, it's another sort of medical... I know the you know, 17th, medical but not the 19th. <laughs> anyway, tell me. So the uh, differential diagnosis refers to, and, and I thank you for catching me on that, because okay. it's true, we do this. And uh, and, and, and it's, a, it's a very bad habit. And, and so differential diagnosis refers to uh, the list of possible diagnoses that might explain a patient's uh, symptoms or, or, or presentation, as we also, to use another kind of uh, medically uh, corrupted term, I guess you might say. <laughs> so we, um, and, and we teach a kind of uh, 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 attention to facts that often, I think, obscures the truth of the experience of illness that our patients bring to us. And, and, and so we are so, again, focused on, you know, how many centimeters was the lymph node on the CT scan that we are not able to see or even palpate that lymph node when we interact with the patient. All we see is the scan. All we see is the data. And, um, and, and again, that's, uh, that's so alienating, I think, for our patients and certainly devalues the experience of caring for them, I think, for us. Although, it is a convenient kind of crutch if, as we were saying before, if we don't want to, for, for the many reasons we've already enumerated, if we don't want to engage, if we want to make our day go a little bit faster, you know, be more efficient. That's another pressure, by the way, I didn't mention, but that kind of time pressure on well, it, it goes very much together with the notion of slowness. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, but slowness, you know, I'm, I'm interested in slowness in so far that you think it's a teachable uh, skill for writers, uh, for doctors who are in such a rush. Yes. yes. So, you know, how do you slow down the pace in a system where slowness is really mm. not available? Yes. Well, one way to do it is to invite students and trainees into a, a reflective practice. In other words, uh, for example, to ask them to write, uh, to ask them to write reflectively about their experiences and, and join them in that invitation. Uh, and I think of well, one of my, my residents who is in a writing workshop, a reflective writing workshop that I, I lead for our trainees, who 
shared an incredible story with me about how in the moment she was, and I've written about this actually in one of my essays also, that she was called to a code and uh, the patient was in extremis and it was a moment of where she felt she had to shut down entirely her human response to what was going on and become this kind of robot barking out orders, you know, check the potassium, two amps of this, three, you know, we've all seen this depicted on television if you're not in medicine and uh, have experienced it, you know, in the, and, and meanwhile, she came to realize after 30 minutes of this futile code, the patient died and it's many, unfortunately, many so such codes end in, in, in the patient's death. Um, uh, all of that sort of biomedical intensity dissolved uh, and she recognized that there in the room were, was the patient's family and she had completely tuned them out and they had become amply clear in the first five minutes that their mother was dead and yet this whole code had proceeded in front of them in a way that was extremely, she realized afterwards, uh, painful and not to mention medically inappropriate. Um, and so, so she had the occasion then to write about this experience in a poem that she shared with us in, in our writing workshop. And it was really, I think, transformative for her to be able to revisit that moment and, and to recognize the, the ways in which what she had done was, was not really what the, that patient needed at that moment. That all of those, you know, sort of alarms, all of those imperatives to intervene, to do more, to you know, defibrillate, to uh, wasn't right. What perhaps? What should, what should she have done? What? Yes, and so what she she asked that could. question herself. What could? What else could she have done? Might she have spent that those precious last few minutes of that patient's life being present with the family and consoling them, comforting them, or even comforting the patient, warming that patient's hand? Uh, as she was nearing death. You know, might she have uh, been able to bring in the chaplain at that moment to, to ensure that that patient's last rites were administered, and, which is soul-saving in many religions for many, for many people who, again, you know, that, those kinds of things that might have been much more important to the family, to the patient herself, uh, were, were entirely lost. And, and, and so, you know, I think we, we, we ought to at least consider the, the value of reflection, the value of, of a different kind of, of presence in those moments with our patients uh, before we simply, again, resort to the kind of just the facts, just the data, what's the next step in the algorithm, what's the next thing I'm supposed to do uh, it, when, it's, when the tracing shows this arrhythmia. You know, and, and really integrate better uh, the humanistic, the humane, with with the scientific. I think what 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 um, this conjures up for me is just how under, under how much pressure you are. Mm. Um, I mean, I, I I find it remarkable mm. to be a doctor, and also remarkable to be so poorly equipped. Mm. Well, um, yes, it's, um, it's... So on the one hand, I admire what you do, and on the other hand, I feel sad that so many doctors don't, don't, uh, don't have the tools quite mm. to... Mm. and don't have the occasion, quite frankly, yes. to write the poem that mm. doctor had an occasion to write, to know that language in that way, expression in that way, yes. could perhaps, if not heal the wound, at least revisit it and yes. react differently the next time round. Yes, absolutely. I think, and and the irony of it, Paul, I think, is that, in some sense, we actually we, we do have the tools, and we just we we actively suppress them or push them aside, and and actively devalue them. And I can't tell you how many times I've been. Uh, in some senses uh, patronized or in other senses you know sort of chastised for for wanting to bring the humanities in the sort of broad sense uh, to the work of, of, of medicine that that's that's soft that's mm -hmm. that's that's what a waste of time you know I'm so busy how can I even think about sharing a poem or a story with a, I, I mean 
It's, or, or worse, that's crazy. Why would you? Why would you do that? That's. But you do. You it's do. Distracting. You do worse than that. I do worse than that. You do worse than that because you actually sometimes infiltrate with with a poem that you put in all these papers with the 19 diagnoses. Yes. And it's interesting also, you've, I have to say, uh, to report on that, yeah. that my patients often what they want to talk to me about and what I've, I've shared with them is not the latest you know, research on you know, uh, the chemotherapy agent that they're considering, but, but that poem that you shared by, by Marilyn Hacker or by Tom Gunn, that, that really spoke to me. It helped me so much to make sense of what I'm going through right now. Thank you so much for, for doing that, for, sh for seeing me as a person, for, for recognizing that, that what I'm going through is really, really hard, is really difficult. And um, you know, those kinds of responses make me believe that, that there is some value to this, that there is, that there is some power some in it. hope in some sense. A hope, yes, and, and a sense also, I think, of, 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 of a shared experience that, that that when we do to patients, I think we consciously and unconsciously send the message that you're in this by yourself. This is, and, and, and frequently when we reach the limit of the interventions, doctors disappear, oncologists disappear, a lot of the specialists disappear, and the patient discovers that indeed I am alone in this. Hospitals become very quiet, as you said mm -hmm. before. And very empty. And, uh, and, and yet they're full of doctors. And, and so we are, are, again, I think, missing such an important opportunity for healing, uh, again, in that larger sense that when we may not attain the biomedical cure we all hope for, yes, it's wonderful when the patient is cured. And I'm not saying we shouldn't still tr always try to do that. But there's a difference between a cure and healing. Yes, there is a... Articulate that a little bit. There is an extremely important difference because I think one can be healed, certainly, without being cured. And I've seen that on many occasions, particularly with patients, again, at the end of life, where where what is most important in that moment, as, as we were saying just a moment ago, is, is empathetic listening, is sharing that, hearing that story, those last words uh, that are, are, are just absolutely precious and and how many times I think I have participated myself in suppressing those putting the tube down intubating someone you know which is a the, way of silence which is a them. way of you know or giving them so much pain medication that they can't they talk. can't talk that they can't uh, because you didn't want to hear the the because it was easier complaint. in some sense to to do that and and we might say in our our own biomedical narrative well we're we're doing what we need to do to ease that patient's pain. Um, but sometimes that's not really why we do it. Uh, I think sometimes, to be, to be very honest, uh, it's done to, to silence someone. To be blunt, has being a poet made you a better doctor? I think so. I mean, I think it's, it's so much enriched my practice of medicine that it's made me, I think, again, able to overcome some of the distancing that I, I was taught and to really uh, be a, a participant in these experiences. And, and I think it's, it's, it's not about necessarily asking patients to write about their experiences or, or prescribing poetry necessarily, but it, it's really, I think, much more about the, the gesture of, of sharing a, a human experience that, we, that, that says, that acknowledges we are both in this together. We are fellow travelers. We are both facing mortality in that largest sense together as, as two human beings in, in, in the same place at the same moment. And, uh, and that kind of immediacy, you know, which is a kind of a paradox of slow medicine, I guess you might say. But, um, but that, there's nothing m more, uh, I think, compelling or more gripping than than, than being with a patient in that, in that moment. You know, it reminded me of a wonderful line I've always loved of uh, the Danish philosopher Kierkegaard, who mm. said that the goal is to arrive at immediacy after reflection. Mm. Wonderful, wonderful, yes. And that is what I think 
you know, when my colleagues say, well, how do you, you know, how, how, do, how can I, even if I were open to it, how could I even make use it's of poetry? An extraordinary, it's an extraordinary <laughs> comment, you know, yes. even if I were open. Yes. If for one moment I availed myself of other people, <laughs> what might happen to me? Yes, I mean, exactly. That's what how evade, could I use you know, it? You know, and, 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 and this, what, is, what is so interesting about that is that the major experiences of our life have to do with that moment of being off balance. Yes. We fall in love. Yes. I mean, quite literally. Mm, absolutely. So the, the, the notion of, of availing oneself of an experience and being frightened to do yes. so is so interesting. Yes. But is it not a luxury in some way? It is, I think, in some sense. I always have to remind myself, too, that I'm, I'm very fortunate to have had the kind of parenting I had, the kind of education I had that, that really challenged me to remain open uh, in these ways to the, the people I encounter through my work as a, as a physician. And so, so I, I realize in some ways it is, it's a privilege to some extent of, 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 of that education I had, of that experience I've had. And, um, and it is a luxury, I think. You know, we, we um, I, I think especially in this moment when we are under so many kinds of pressures as physicians. And, and I hope also that I don't come across as doctor bashing. I certainly don't want to no, send that message. No, I think you are not, I, I mean, I don't hear you doc, doctor bashing as much as um, kind of a, a, a cry against a certain form a discipline is taking. Yes. Um, um, and in some way, you know, Napoleon once said of one of his generals that he knew everything and nothing else. <laughs> and it, it's, it strikes me as relevant. Yes, I mean, it we, really we, feels very true of, 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 of medicine, really. We have a kind of uh, an arrogance about, you know, we, we know more than our patients do. We have all of our well, you book do knowledge. to some extent. I mean, we the, have the, technical the thing is, you do to some extent. And, you know, it, it, it struck me, as I mentioned, surgery, it struck me that I was in the hands of mm. and dependent on mm. and completely available to. Yes. Um, utterly vulnerable mm. to also. Yes. Um, and it also struck me that, did I really care, and this is more retrospectively now after reading your work, did I really care if the doctor who was going to mm. operate me knew the poems mm. of Gabriel Garcia Lorca? Ah, that's a wonderful uh, question, I think, mm -hmm. also, Paul, to have in your mind as we, as, we, as we discuss these issues. And I think that, you know, that there is certainly, I think, there's a kind of patient, I would say, perhaps, that, that does, I think, wish for the doctor who is uh, so technically competent, that is the expert that will, that will tell him exactly what to do, and there won't be any kind of mystery about it, there won't be any kind of um, appreciation of the complexity of, of the situation. It will be a very cutting, cutting to the point, uh, cut and dry uh, kind of response to uh, what is uh, terrifying uh, when one's body uh, betrays uh, the, 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 the usual um, uh, health that we, we enjoy. And so, um, so I, I understand uh, where that comes from, but I, I, would, I would say to that patient, and I have said this to some of my patients who have uh, uh, looked, and certainly to some of my colleagues who have looked a little askance at what I do, you know, I, I have said to them that, don't you also want a physician who does know Lorca's poems so that should that intervention not work or go wrong in some terrible way, which happens frequently, uh, in medicine, and certainly all of us will reach a point in our narrative where there isn't again going to be another surgery, another procedure. That don't we also want our doctors to be able to be present with us at those moments as well, when when we are bewildered by what is happening, when we feel wonder at how the body works. Uh, those kinds of shared experiences, I think, again, get to this notion of healing, where, uh, again, the cure is, is 
in some sense is the easy part. The hardest part is being present, you know, at that moment where where my resident was doing all the right things medically, competently, you know, doing the right things algorithmically, and and entirely missed an opportunity. Missed the point to be a healer. I mentioned I mentioned Lorca not uh, <laughs> as a as a coincidence of a poet that, that you might know of, but Lorca is a poet that you you deeply appreciate oh, and yes. have translated. Yes, yes. So tell me something about the notion of translating yes. Lorca and how oh. that might have helped you in some way yes. in your professional life. Yes, I think it's... I, I know it's complicated of a question, no, but it's a, it's a the notion question, of translation yeah. there. Yes, it's wonderful, I think, that uh, to engage in another language and to make it comprehensible uh, both in its content but also in its gestures uh, to another audience that doesn't perhaps uh, know that language. And it, it really is, I think, useful uh, to me to be a translator because I, I find that, the, that being a doctor, one of the, the things that, again, uh, I think is important in healing is to be able to translate as well as uh, uh, be present. And so, so so to, in a sense, disarm that medical ease and to translate it into the language that our patients understand. So I'm not saying things like differential diagnosis uh, without, without translating you'll, that. You'll be careful now. Yes, I'll be even more careful. Yes, okay. yes but, but yes, there, there is a, such an important aspect of medicine that has to do with uh, translating what we are doing into human terms that, that we can all understand. And you know that and one often says about translation, traductore, traditore. Yeah. Yes. Translate that traitor. Yes. Right? So and Lorca was yeah. very, very uh, aware. aware of the ways in which uh, translation betrays uh, the original. And, and I, but I think it's a good kind of betrayal in medicine, that it's a, it's a necessary kind of betrayal because it, it, it invites the patient into the conversation uh, that we are too often having uh, privately, either in our own heads or, you know, at the co in the conference room, you know, in the nurses' stations where no one can hear us but ourselves, and and uh, it's really important that that patients, uh, I think, and participate. Trans and translation is also another form of slowing down. Yes, absolutely. Um, poem, uh, poetry, and poets. And they've had an influence on you. You've studied with some of them, whether it's Pinsky or uh. Walcott or others. Um, in, in what way have, the, have poets, and perhaps even more precisely poets who were doctors, helped you? Oh, my goodness. Well, I think, of course, uh, William Carlos Williams, uh, perhaps the most important American poet, one of my heroes. And I think, you know, perhaps the way he has helped me the most, or his example and his work, uh, have helped me the most uh, has to do with a kind of advocacy around uh, patients and the lives that uh, we lead that are um, frequently marginalized in the ways in which I think he really tried to bring a more democratic idiom into the language of poetry uh, to help us recognize those people at the margin, those people at uh, uh, who are living who are living narratives or stories that that we frequently don't see or don't hear that again we turn our heads away from and so turn our eyes away from so I think you know that it's, notion it's of a social head, head and eyes yes both things yeah, they, yeah. they're, they're yeah, they anatomically yeah. connected um, and so yes uh, but uh, it is we are averting our gaze yes and we are also denying those narratives, yeah. right? Also in our minds, as you say. And silencing them, because when yes. you don't look at someone, yes, you in a way silence You them. are absolutely silencing them. And I think of that wonderful poem of Williams, you know, the, the, the woman eating the plum, and Do how... you know some lines? Uh, yes. it, it was... Uh, I, I, I can almost uh, taste them. Uh, it's such a sensual poem, but uh, uh, it was... And it's part of the way the poem works, is the way in which the lines are in jam, so that... Uh, the emphasis on a repeated line, it was uh, delicious, it was delicious, it was delicious um, changes as you make your way through the poem so that 
uh, it becomes perhaps in the beginning an experience of, of observation and, and in some sense distancing. And then as one makes one's way through this very, very short poem, you are tasting the plum with that person and sharing a very sensual experience with that person. And so um, it's a wonderful poem, and I'm sorry I can't. No, 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 but you know, it, it strikes me that the, the people we get on with in life are people whose adjectives we share. Yes, yes. Right, so, so there's, the, there's that strong form of empathy where you are speaking the same language, and yes. this is what you're describing in this notion. And the empathy in some way is to taste yeah. the same fruit. Yes, yes. I mean, and, um, and I think those are the best poems, aren't they? That when we when we we are tasting the same fruit. When and I think of some of the poems by, again I mentioned Tom Gunn or Marilyn Hacker, where we are we are asked. In fact, we are we are. Uh, it, it's a, a demand that we not look away. That we that we see what those at the margins are seeing. That we feel those things. Uh, and that, that to me is, the, 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 those are the best poems that, that, that really enter us, as we said, and open our wounds, our own wounds, to, uh, to, to those wounds of others. And, and that we can communicate in that way, I think, on such a visceral level. It's, uh, those, those are the, the poets and the poems that I find most compelling. I'd like to first to move you back to your complicated origin, <laughs> um, Cuba, mm. and the imaginary yes. Cuba, because it's a Cuba you have not visited. That's right. Yeah. It's a Cuba that belongs to part of your family that you would like to visit yeah. with your father, but can't. You can't take him there yes. because it's too painful for him. Mm -hmm. And yet, you want to go, but maybe you don't want to go. <laughs> yeah. So maybe before even telling us why you do want to go and don't want to go, um, you will read one of my very favorite poems, ah. which is called Havana. Oh, thank you. Okay. Oh. Havana. When we were six or seven, Dad would quiz us on the capitals of the world me and my kid brothers who didn't even know our own address. We lived in New Jersey, not Cuba, and our ignorance seemed like the reason we would never, ever go there. So I tried to memorize the names of stars pin printed on my National Geographic map of the world. L-I-M-A was the capital of Peru, not just a kind of bean I hated. <laughs> I wondered if Peru was anything like Cuba. I wondered if I would ever see what I imagined were the horrible, muddy streets of Helsinki, which sounded like a place where sinners like me would be punished, <laughs> sucked into the earth for good. Even Ottawa, in our nice neighbor Canada, seemed incomprehensibly far away. It was always at dinner time when he'd start in on us. Who knows the capital of Burma? I stared into my succotash, pushing it around and around with my fork, sure that children there were starving, dying of starvation in a city whose name I didn't even know. One night, with the distant stars flickering outside the steamed up kitchen windows, he asked, does anyone here know the capital of Cuba? Every bone in my body ached with the answer the one place in the world I most wanted to visit, the one place in the world whose name was always impossible for me to remember. Mm. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Makes me think of my, my dad. Oh, someday. We say in, in uh, Cuban expatriate communities, you know, algún día. Someday, uh, I, I really want to, to, to be there physically. But I also recognize, as you were suggesting, Paul, that once I visit Cuba, this huge territory in my imagination will suddenly be uh, altered. It will be known in a way that uh, is 
perhaps not best for my writing anyway. Well, it, could be, it, it could be detrimental. It could be. It could so be. That, so what I'd like us to, to ponder a little bit slowly is, is precisely on not taking the journey. Mm. Um, yes. Algún día a lo mejor. Yes. Pero quizás no. Pica. Sí. We can now, we said we would switch to Spanish. But sí, en español ahora. No, ahora hablamos español mm -hmm. solamente. solamente. Pero de verdad, maybe, yes. in fact, uh, the imaginary Cuba is, um, you know, I took a trip with my father to, to Vienna. He was born in 1918, and as a 21st birthday for, for he asked me what I wanted, and I said a trip to Vienna. Mm. And we visited Vienna, the Vienna of his um, early years. He left when he was um, 20, 20 to go to Haiti, mm. a very small Jewish community in Haiti. And we took this trip back. And he would, with his finger, he would indicate, mm. his index finger, he would indicate all these places that were no longer. Mm. Mm -hmm. And we spent a whole week like that. And after a week, I really got depressed because everything, <laughs> though I didn't, I didn't quite have the words for it, everything he showed me was absent. Mm -hmm. And I told him that. And he said, no, not at all. For me, this is really powerful because I'm here to tell you the story. Mm -hmm. Now, that, that is one version mm -hmm. of a father and a son taking a trip. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't sound like the version you could ever take with your own father. You said it made you think of your father. Mm, yes. Your father is hesitant to expose you. Yes. Yes, I think, you know, it's, it's interesting as I was thinking of him and, and thinking and reading that, that poem, I, I think in some ways one of my, uh, or one of the reasons perhaps for my you know, ongoing battle against distancing is, is because of the distancing that he has always enforced around oh, so Cuba, you know that that uh, and that's been such a pol policed, enforced kind of boundary that um, you don't this, talk to him about it. In certain very ways. little, very little. It was my my grandmother was the one who always was the teller of stories about about Cuba, but my father and grandfather uh, were so embittered and I think so traumatized. By what happened, and the, by the dispossession of, 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 of what, of, of losing everything uh, in their minds, uh, that that they couldn't tell those stories, and 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 so at an early age, I think you know that that imaginative journey. I, I spoke about it, I think, a little earlier. That that somehow seemed like a possibility for healing was always through those stories my grandmother told, or through the poems that. She would read to me by Marti or by even Neruda, or, or you know that those poems represented a way back to this forbidden place, and I think I'm still trying to write those poems myself. I'm trying to trying to find my way back to Cuba across this this distance that is, and, and similarly in medicine, I'm trying I, to. I, I think you have a title for a collection. I, mean, <laughs> I will have finding to finding my way back to Cuba. It yeah. seems such a glorious title and, uh, and in a way um, I'm not encouraging you not to go uh, but I know how much you you have a complicated but a close relationship uh, with Susan Sontag and she uh, has a wonderful line yeah. um, in a story I think on a trip not taken to China but it, mm -hmm. it, it, it doesn't quite have that title where she says just wait until now becomes then. Mm. You'll see how happy we were. Oh, what a wonderful line, yes. Well, she is also, you know, another, you know, very powerful figure in, in my imagination. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, what she has to say about um, metaphoric thinking as it relates to illness, I think, is another one of those kinds of um, uh, uh, fractures, in a sense, that I, I, I feel like I'm trying to overcome in, in my own practice of medicine, and, and certainly through my, my, my but own. You disagree with her, also. I, I hate to say I disagree with Susan Sontag. You know what? You won't be the first, <laughs> <laughs> because she's such a such a powerful intellect. But and, you do. But I do, in this one sense, I think that that you know when she says that uh, that 
uh, metaphoric thinking, for example, is is harmful to people living with illness. That, and that, uh, and I think she implies this perhaps more than she says it explicitly. But that, but that in science, we have facts and we have, you know, something we can really sort of sink our teeth into that we can uh, that we can uh, act on in a way that uh, rationally uh, follows and makes sense. Um, and, and, and thereby, I think she negates the power of the imagination to do some of that same kind of very important work that, again, that I think of as healing and that not, and, and I guess I might also add that not all metaphoric thinking around illness need be negative. You know, I think what she, excuse me, rails against the most is the kind of negative metaphoric thinking, superstition, you know, cancer comes from repressed anger, uh, AIDS is a punishment from God, those kinds of negative metaphors around uh, understanding illness or w why we become ill. Um, but I think she neglects that. There are positive metaphors uh, that can be uh, used to help us live with illness actually more, more constructively and can, can lead, again, to healing or to wellness, in a, again, in a different sense than uh, that sort of strict biomedical cure that, that she seeks, that she relies on, I think, so, so much. And so... Someone else who was very important <coughs> to you and who you studied with mm. is Eve Sedgwick. Mm. And um, yes. I'd like to read a small passage you write about her in your days at Amherst. Hearing our poems read aloud by Professor Sedgwick at the head of the class like a great white angel heralding our arrival into our own worlds and bodies, I felt the rhythm so deeply I was overcome by a feeling that for a long time I had been drowning. Mm. Later on you say I was reborn that afternoon and when I stood up to leave the classroom my knees wobbled like a newborn lamb mm. and, the, and the black linoleum beneath my, feel, my, my feet seemed as thick and tenacious as the black mud of a fertile rain-drenched field. Mm. <laughs> I resolved that I would no longer allow myself to die. That is, yes, that's how Eve made me feel and still makes me feel when I, when I think about her as a teacher and, and how she, she made art um, so compelling for me at that time in my life and, and presented it to me in, in, in a way that that spoke in, in, in that very powerful way. Uh, again, at a time when I was beginning just to imagine you know, uh, what it might be like to become a physician and, and, and through my science courses, uh, envisioning a very different kind of way of um, being, a, uh, being an intellect in, in the world of medicine. That, and, and to have that permission, if you will, and more than permission, that, that kind of uh, charge to uh, you know to go out into the world as as a poet and uh, to feel sensually uh, what I was learning about in biology uh, and in in the in the sort of the body uh, uh, was 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 just uh, just extraordinary. I, I I can't thank her enough for what she taught me. You know, in reading in reading that passage and slowly in closing, it seemed to me that it would be right for me, since it gave you so much pleasure back then, to give you pleasure again now and read a poem to you of yours. Ah. Um, and then I'm going to ask you to read a poem of someone else, oh, and then we will slowly close. Ah. Um, this is a poem addressed to Gary Fisher. Mm. Um, it's called, For You All Beauty. Um, maybe I should read it first, and then you can comment on it in your own words. Because you are so beautiful, you fall too gracefully. You fall because I need to rescue you until I lose the meaning of your death. Try not to focus on the breaths you take before the final cliff. Imagine the extravagance of dying young. You sequin dress, the city lit at night, the dance, so memorable, so memorable and intimate that neither partner can forget how close it felt. Our gazes met, fall easily as beauty ought 
to fall. As for your final thought, consider what the Romans taught. The people whom they conquered, all is beautiful. And what is killed returns in monuments. Recall how beautiful you were. You went unyielding to your deaths, unspent, deserving of a monument or great cathedral, even Rome itself. Imagine you enthroned among these martyrs, you whose crime and only crime was how you loved. I love you, even as you leave, so beautiful, so fucking brave, and all emaciated. Touch my face, my burning cock, my chest. Embrace me, most of all, forgive with grace, your conquerors including me. I feel I loved you greedily, were not enough perhaps to see, past monuments, past hospitals, just you alive. I try to tell myself, you'll live made beautiful by aid so beautiful and true, so unmistakable and true. You'll never die. Remember who we are, together we are more than any virus, murderer or monument. The truth before you take your final breath, my love, is this. Beyond this place above the clouds, for you all beauty grieves. Oh, I haven't uh, thought about that poem in a long time. and. Gary was a, a very um, dear friend who also uh, was my patient, and uh, it was, um, I think, important. One of the most important uh, relationships I had early in my career as a doctor, um, and that he was he was a writer himself, and I think um, watching him and at the same time trying to be present with him uh, as he faced. An untimely death was uh, was again you know the kind of uh, lesson that is uh, in some sense is almost impossible to to articulate you know and I was uh, struggling so much as I think as I hope the poem uh, represents with these notions of what it meant to be a physician to be a doctor and um, you know the ways in which we uh, objectify illness and the notion of of you know the this sort of uh, monument that that is a recurring image in the poem, and and how even I think poems sometimes monumentalize and objectify uh, more than they uh, truly bear witness. And so I was struggling with that notion of art as well. That you know how could I continue to make poems, uh, never mind be a doctor when when Gary was dying, when this incredible uh, imagination, this amazing soul was 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 leaving the world and, and yet and yet it was uh impossible not to make that poem impossible not to uh care for him and impossible really not to uh suffer with him you took poet you you wrote that poem and you also took photographs of yes him. yes and that was something you know and and uh we spoke briefly of of, of eve and she was also uh, uh, a part of that circle of, of, of friends and, and people who helped take care of Gary. And, um, and uh, one of the things we did that I think was extraordinarily healing was to take pictures of each other and then create these collages that were like a, a kind of alternative universe where he still lives. You know, I have that collage, you know, in my study where all of us are, are still together. And, I often think of that as a kind of a metaphor still for together. how, yes, yes, so we're still together and that art makes that possible in a way that medicine, you know, sadly uh, failed us. You know, we, we uh, well, Gary couldn't be cured of, of AIDS at that time, certainly, and, and even now, even with all the wonderful treatment we have uh, for, for people living with HIV, um, we still don't have a cure. Uh, and yet, and yet art does immortalize him, and he is still here in those in those photographs and those collages we created in in that poem, I think. And so, so perhaps that's 
another um, reason we, we ought to um, rely on, on the poem in medicine is it, 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 it does something that medicine can never do, which is uh, to let us live forever, really, to immortalize us, to, uh, to be together always, in a sense. In closing, I'll have you read two poems. You will choose which one of your poems you would like to read at the end. Mm. The choices between morbidity and mortality rounds and um, reforming health care. Mm. And before that, you will, I will ask you to read a poem by Clive James, oh. which I had you read just before yeah. we came in. Um, just read it. <laughs> oh. Japanese maple. Your death, near now, is of an easy sort. So slow a fading out brings no real pain. Breath growing short is just uncomfortable. You feel the drain of energy, but thought and sight remain, enhanced in fact. When did you ever see so much sweet beauty as when fine rain falls on that small tree and saturates your brick back garden walls, so many amber rooms and mirror halls? Ever more lavish as the dusk descends, this glistening illuminates the air. It never ends. Whenever the rain comes, it will be there beyond my time, but now I take my share. My daughter's choice, the maple tree is new. Come autumn and its leaves will turn to flame. What I must do is live to see that. That will end the game for me, though life continues all the same. Filling the double doors to bathe my eyes a final flood of colors will live on as my mind dies, burned by my vision of a world that shone so brightly at the last and then was gone. That's extraordinary. That's, uh, I think that's what we were talking about. That's what poems do. And, uh, and it's a different form of making you silent mm -hmm. because it's not a silence that averts its gaze. Yes, yeah. it's a silence I think that embraces all the all the pain of of a life ending, but also again the the beauty and the, the tree will the way in which life does go on and uh, and that our voices. Uh, continue to be heard. Uh, I want to come back to this poem in 10 years with my students, and I would like to come back to it when I'm at this point in my life. When you're at this point in your life, um, the kind of physician you would want to have mm -hmm. by your side would have what qualities? Well, I hope you'd want to share it with me and read it with me and talk about what it means and and be silenced by it too at the same time to, to be able to appreciate the paradox. There's so many wonderful ways in which the poet shows us how life is short in, in, the, in the shaping of the language itself. Um, those wonderful short lines uh, throughout the poem are a way of reiterating that each time. And, and I'd love to have that kind of conversation with whoever's taking care of me at that point in my life. Um, How, which one of the two poems would you like to read? I think I'll, uh, maybe Morbidity and Mortality, right? I, I felt two, but I wasn't sure. <laughs> maybe that one would be a, a good way I to close. Here you are. Or, or to, to open. To open. Mm -hmm. Morbidity and Mortality rounds. Forgive me, body before me, for this. Forgive me for my bumbling hands, unschooled in how to touch. I meant to understand what fever was, not love. 
Forgive me for my stare, but when I look at you, I see myself laid bare. Forgive me, body, for what seems like calculation when I take a breath before I cut you with my knife, because the cancer has to be removed. Forgive me for not telling you, but I'm not no poet. Forgive me, please. Forgive my gloves, my callous greeting, my unease. You must not realize I just met death again. Forgive me if I say he looked impatient. Please forgive me my despair, which once seemed more like recompense. Forgive my greed. Forgive me for not having more to give you than this bitter pill. Forgive for this apology, too late for those like me whose crimes might seem innocuous and yet whose cruelty was obvious. Forgive us for these sins. Forgive me, please, for my confusing heart that sounds so much like yours. Forgive me for the night when I sleep too, beside you under the same moon. Forgive me for my dreams, for my rough knees, for giving up too soon. Forgive me, please, for losing you, unable to forgive. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. On behalf of Sandra and the Schemmel Forum and the Commonwealth Medical College, I'd like to quote, to close with a quote that you will see in the lobby on your way out that I think embodies what you were talking about being present for the, for the patient. There was a quote that was often quoted to our medical students by a beloved professor here, Ray Smigo, which uh, is attributed to an anonymous Greek physician. But the role of the physician is to cure sometimes, to heal often, but to comfort always. Thank you. Thank you all very much.